Hello, my name is Dylan, and welcome to Chapter 13 of the Barron's AP, AP Economics book. I will be covering what you need to know for the AP Economics exam in this video. First off, you need to know what the wage elasticity of demand is, what marginal revenue product and marginal factor cost is, what marginal physical product is, what a monopsony is, and what a Lorenz curve looks like. First off, the main topic in this chapter is labor. Labor is a resource and it can be bought or sold. Now, the price labor is sold at is called the wage rate, and the quantity is just the quantity supplied. So labor has also has a supply and demand, just like in a product market. How labor works is that as wages go up, the quantity demanded for it goes down. Obviously, businesses would rather hire less workers when the cost of hiring one is too high. Now, wage elasticity is just like price elasticity. It measures the change in quantity demanded after a change in wage. High wage elasticity means that it's elastic and that the quantity demanded is sensitive to price changes. To wage changes, sorry. A wage elasticity of one is unit elastic and less than one is inelastic or insensitive to wage changes. Wage elasticity is related to, to the price elasticity of a good. If a good is elastic, it will mean that the wage elasticity is also elastic. This is because, if, for example, if businesses ha they'll have a harder time passing on an increase in labor cost to the consumer. Like, for example, if the, if the wage rate if goes up, the businesses would obviously want to increase the price of the good. However, if the good is elastic, it means the consumers will buy a lot less of the good, and the businesses, they just have a hard time just raising the price of the good. Therefore, most likely, they'll end up cutting the labor costs and not raising the price, and this will mean that there's be a huge change in, in labor and hiring labor. Also, we, if labor costs are a huge portion of the cost of production, businesses are also more sensitive to the wage changes, because a wage increase will mean that the cost will increase dramatically. And lastly, if there are a lot of substitutes for labor, such as machinery, the demand for labor will be much more elastic because if wages increase, businesses can just substitute in machinery and hire fewer workers. Now, the demand for labor is derived from the demand of the good. This means that the graph of labor will look very similar to the demand graph of the good. It's always downsloping with an inverse relationship between price and quantity. As wages go up, less labor is hired, and as wages go down, more labor is hired. Marginal revenue product is the firm's demand for labor, and it basically measures the worker's contribution to the firm. This is equal to the revenue times product per product times the marginal physical product, or the additional product a worker brings to the firm. Basically, a worker brings in this much additional product, so multiply the revenue to find how much additional revenue he brings in, and then you use that to calculate how much workers you hire. Marginal factor cost is the additional cost of hiring an additional worker. And these two combine to determine how many workers a firm will hire to maximize output. So this graph shows a labor market and a firm's demand for labor. The graph on the right shows the labor market. You have a downsloping demand for labor because firms will hire more at a cheaper price and an upsloping, upward sloping supply curve because more people want to work at higher wages. The intersection between the two is called the equilibrium wage. Now the firm, now this is a perfectly competitive labor market. It's similar to a perfectly competitive firm. So the firm on the left is a price taker, and they cannot influence the equilibrium wage. This means that they can hire as many workers as they want as the market, at the market rate, which is why the supply curve for labor for the firm is horizontal. They can hire an infinite, infinite amount of workers at the market rate. There are so many workers that none of them can ask for a higher wage. So the firm has, firm has lots, of labor, lots of labor to hire from. This curve is also the marginal factor cost because the additional cost of a worker is just the market rate as each worker can be, as a new worker can be hired for the same price. The demand curve for the firm is the marginal revenue product or how much additional revenue brings in. And the intersection of two is where the firm will hire or the marginal revenue product is equal to the marginal factor cost. This, this is just like a firm trying to maximize profits. This, this, this intersection is where the, the revenue from hiring a work, an additional worker is equal to the cost of hiring that worker. As long as the revenue is greater than the cost, the firm will keep hiring because each worker will bring in more revenue than it costs to hire him or her. 
There's also a different type of labor market structure. This, the last one was called previously perfectly competitive. This one is called a monopsony, similar to a monopoly. In a monopsony, there's only one buyer of labor, and therefore has a direct influence on the overall wage rate. So normally the firm is too small to hire a significant amount of workers, and therefore can hire as much as they want at the market rate. However, a monopsonist will hire a huge amount of workers relative to the market, and therefore needs to increase wages to attract more workers. This has causes the firm's labor supply curve to be upsloping instead of horizontal. What this does is that it causes the marginal factor curve to rise above the supply curve because now it costs more to hire a new worker than it did to hire one, the previous one. This is because in order to hire more workers, they have to pay every single worker a higher wage. The monopsonist also wants to maximize profits, so, higher, so it'll hire at MRP equals MFC or marginal revenue product is equal to marginal factor cost. This will end up causing deadweight loss in the market. So this right here is the, mar is the monopsy. So the demand curve is the same as in a perfectly competitive labor market or the, mar the marginal revenue product. However, the supply curve is now upsloping and the marginal factor cost is no longer the supply curve and it's instead above it. So the monopsonist will hire where MRP is equal to M MFC at this point, or where the marginal revenue products equal to the marginal factor cost. However, so he will hire right here at this quantity. However, he only has to pay his workers this much because at this at this quantity, this is the wage on the supply curve. So right here is where he would be paying. This market was perfectly competitive, and as you can see, the market pays less at this price and it hires less workers. So all businesses want to minimize costs and maximize profits. So minimizing costs is about getting the most revenue per unit cost. So that's why firms always buy resources so that the revenue per unit cost is identical across the board. If let's say one resource provides more revenue per unit cost, they're going to use that resource. And then you want to do it so that they, they, it, so it equalizes, so that make, making sure they're maximizing the revenue per unit cost. The ratio of revenue per unit cost should be equal for all resources whenever a firm is minimizing costs. Now, when a firm is in profit maximizing, they want to make sure that marginal revenue product is equal to ma marginal factor costs for all resources. Because while MRP is equal to F MFC, the firm will get more money by using more resources. Now, I previously said that the supply of labor in industry is upsloping because more people want to work for higher wages. However, in real life, as people make more money, they eventually start, start taking time off work and instead spend time with their family or vacation basically anything leisurely. That's, that's what the back, backward bending supply curve shows. As wages go up, people will supply more labor, but once they're at a certain point, they'll start decreasing the amount of labor supplied because they want more leisure time. However, when you draw labor markets for, the, for an AP test, you should still draw the regular diagonal labor supply line. So the supply of labor can be changed if one of the determinants changes. For example, an occupation can suddenly be more attractive increasing the supply of labor in that field. For example, if the stock market is doing really well, there will be a bunch of people who want to work in finance, so this will increase the supply of labor. Similarly, if more people are overall just supplying an occupation, that will shift the supply as well. Lastly, the supply of labor is affected by competing resources. If the price of computers go up, there will be a shift in the favor of labor, but it can also go the other way around. So the last topic in this chapter is related to income inequality. As you may know, income is not equally distributed in America. So this income inequality can be modeled on a Lorenz curve. So the curve basically shows which, which percentage of Americans own what percentage of the total income. So this x-axis x here basically shows the percentage of households. So basically right here, this means the lowest 20% of Americans own this much wealth. This means the lowest 40% of Americans own this much wealth. Now, obviously, this right here is the lowest 100% of Americans own this much wealth, or 100% of Americans own this much wealth. And it basically starts from the starts from the bottom. The y-axis shows the, um, how much income they own. So as you can see, so this line right here is what's called a perfect income in dis in distribution. The lowest 20% of Americans right here own 20% of the of the country's wealth. 40% of Americans own 40% of wealth, and it goes on, and 100% of Americans own 100% of wealth. However, a real curve will look more like this. The richer people, the, the top 20%, will own more wealth than the lower 20%. And so the Lorenz curve will crunch will crunch a number. And this number rep represents how much um, 
income equality there is. So this number is crunched by taking this area. This area right here is called the income inequality and dividing it by the whole area. So this, this little area divided by this plus this. And so basically a, a number that, of zero basically means there's no income inequality because there's no area here. Uh, a number of one means it's, just per it's perfectly in unequal where only the 100 percentile owns all of the wealth and no one else owns any wealth. And this, this will mean that this, this, there's no area here and this is all of the area. And that's a perfectly vertical line. And that's perfect income inequality. And so obviously you want a lower number and so because a lower number means that there's um, less income inequality. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something from this video.